Seeing as having stationary time series appears to be very, very important for linear regression, it seems pertinent now to introduce one of the tests for whether a time series is stationary. Or specifically for the Dickey-Fuller test for a unit root, what we're actually testing as our null hypothesis is that it, our time series is actually non-stationary. So the idea with the Dickey-Fuller test is that we start off with an AR process. So we have the xt is equal to alpha plus rho times xt minus one plus some error et. And notice that I've included this alpha term here by default. So I'm not specifying whether alpha equals naught, in which case I just have a random walk, or we have random doesn't, oh, alpha doesn't equal to naught rather, in which case we have a model with a stochastic time trend or we have a random walk with drift. It turns out that this particular test, it doesn't matter. We don't need to specify explicitly beforehand what type of random walk we're talking about. So the null hypothesis here is that we have rho is equal to one. Because if rho equals one, we have a non-stationary time series. And the alternative hypothesis here is going to be that rho is less than one, because if rho is less than one, we've already proved that our particular time series, or AR process rather, is stationary. Okay, so you might think that a way to go about testing this would be just to test rho here and test whether rho is different from one. But the problem is, under the null hypothesis, both xt and xt minus one are non-stationary. And when we have time series which are non-stationary, the normal central limit theorems don't apply. So it's not like we can just readily test rho using a, um, an ordinary sort of t-test. Actually, it seems like a better thing to do would be to, let's say we take xt minus one from both sides. So if I take xt minus one from both sides, I have the x t minus x t minus one is equal to alpha plus open bracket rho minus one times x t minus one plus e t, which if I write this a little bit more neatly, the left hand side is just what we define as the change in x t and that's equal to alpha plus delta times x t minus one plus e t. And notice that under the null hypothesis here that rho equals one, this particular term, this delta term here, would in fact vanish. So we wouldn't actually have this xt on this side here. Whereas if we have rho is less than one, we're gonna have that we do have this xt on this right-hand side here, but this xt minus one is gonna be itself stationary, so it's not a problem. And just if I didn't say it when we were talking about rho equals one, if rho equals one, because this disappears, this left-hand side is stationary and we don't have any non-stationary variables on our right-hand side. So we're better off than we were in this place. Okay, so how do we actually go about testing whether we have a non-stationary time series or whether we have a unit root? Because a unit root is when we have rho is equal to one, in which case delta is just equal to zero. Well, a way that you might think that we could do this would be just to calculate an ordinary t statistic on this delta term here, or specifically on the estimated value of delta, which we call delta hat. And then if we compare that t statistic with a t distribution, perhaps then that would allow us to determine whether or not we had a stationary time series or a non-stationary time series. But the problem is, under the null hypothesis being true, x t minus one is itself non-stationary. So the ordinary central limit theorems don't apply for when we're thinking about the estimators for delta or the least squares estimating estimator for delta, which we call delta hat. So it's not the case that under a large sample size or an asymptotic sample size that delta has a given t distribution or a normal distribution really. So what can we actually do here? Well, it turns out all is not lost because thanks to the fellows Dickey and Fuller, who actually tabulated the asymptotic distribution of the least squares estimator for delta under the null hypothesis of it being a unit root, it turns out that we can actually just compare our ordinary t-statistic with the values of this Dickey-Fuller distribution. 
And it turns out that if the t is less than some critical value from the Dickey-Fuller distribution, then in only in those circumstances do we reject the null hypothesis. And a note of caution here, because delta is going to be less than 1, we should suppose that t itself is going to be negative, and hence we're comparing whether our negative value of t is less than some other negative value. So it's not the case that the magnitude will necessarily be less than. It is that the absolute actual true value of the t will be less than. So let me just say that again. It is that the t value itself will, in real value terms, be less than the Dickey-Fuller critical value.